Recording in progress. Venkat, are we live? Yeah. We are, we are live, sir. We are live. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, delegates across the globe, professionals from not only the anesthesia fraternity, from but from other specialities and other fields. Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning, depending on uh, which part of the globe you are. I welcome you to this uh, highly anticipated webinar on safety, titled Safety First, uh, the Expert Talks, where we focus on the safety issues, the learnings from aviation and anesthesia. This is a unique platform for knowledge exchange and collaboration and innovation between some of the top experts in the field of safety from aviation and anesthesia. Over the course of the next two hours, we will delve into the intricacies of safety culture, the human factors associated with safety, the importance of communication, networks, how do we manage failures, and how do we navigate the sea of training and education. The experts in their talks and in the discussions that will follow will share real life incidents, what they have learned from the past experiences and how they have improved safety in their own domains. And by bringing two domains which are obsessed with giving utmost value to human life, we will cross-pollinate ideas between both these domains and learn from each other. Now, this is a very unique opportunity for all of you to interact with these experts and ask them questions as to what safety is and how you can improve it in your field. So to start the evening, I would like to invite Captain Amit Singh. Now, just a brief uh, introduction of Dr. Captain Amit Singh here. Now, Captain Amit Singh has been uh, a pioneer when it comes to safety in aviation in India. With over 18,000 hours of flying experience on Boeing 777 and Airbus A320, he has been uh, a pioneer when it comes to safety and setting up uh, operations for many airlines, uh, namely uh, Indigo and AirAsia. He has been the chief of safety for AirAsia India and the head of training for Indigo. He is also the founder for Safety Matters Foundation, which is an Indian NGO on aviation safety. He is a member of the Flight Operations Group of the Royal Aeronautical Society in London. He is a fellow of the Royal Aeronautical Society of London, and that is the highest grade attainable and bestowed upon those in the profession mm -hmm. of aeronautics and aerospace. He is a key member of the senior management team associated with two startup airlines in India, namely Indigo and AirAsia. No more startups, of mm -hmm. course, they're one of the mainstream uh, airlines. And he's also an active uh, blogger, a speaker at many of the international meetings for global training and safety. So I welcome you, sir, for joining us, mainly anesthetists, uh, in this uh, unique webinar. And we would like to listen to you and also interact and learn from you uh, in the coming hour or so. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Murli. It's a pleasure and a great honor to be uh, on this forum, and uh, which is attended globally uh, the most important part is exchange of information. So we all learn and continue to learn. And learning never stops. And uh, across cultures and uh, across industries, uh, we must keep on learning. And uh, that is how we build safety and safety progresses. I have a small presentation from my side, a uh, couple of slides. Uh, people would know the basics of safety, which is common in every industry. Uh, but there are certain things which are unique to aviation, uh, which might come up in the uh, presentation or in the discussion. So hopefully this will be a fruitful uh, uh, discussion and a presentation. 
So like we say, safety first uh, was a term which was used earlier. Now we call it safety is ingrained in every process. So as a part of the safety management, every process has to have safety involved. So we cannot prioritize that it is first or uh, mid or last. So that will come up in the presentation. Uh, we I'll start with the presentation with an example of a daily life. Every day we plan something and what happens at the end of it is totally different. So how does safety come in between and uh, the principles of safety? If we analyze it, then only we can learn. Otherwise, we go through the motions every day, but do not realize what all aspects are playing in the background. So, for example, we have an important meeting somewhere in the town and uh, we must attend it. But uh, as luck would have it, your spouse leaves before you and uh, basically leaves something on the gas or the burner, uh, maybe a teapot boiling, which overflows. So this delays your startup, your plan. You, everybody has a plan A and a plan B. But you're desperate to have some tea before you leave to freshen up yourself. So you clean up the mess, put some tea leaves to boil and quickly uh, gulp down a cup of tea. So you think that, yes, you're on track. But uh, in the rush, you leave the house, reach your car and realize that you haven't collected the car keys and the house keys are still inside. The door is locked. So there goes your day. So now you start thinking about alternatives. You realize that, uh, yes, uh, you have a neighbor or you have a spare key which you leave somewhere uh, hidden in a hidden place. But when you go there, you realize that you gave it to a friend of yours a couple of days back. So your other plan goes. Now you go for the next best option is go to a neighbor, borrow the car. But the neighbor says that the car is broken down. So a mechanical failure. Now you start looking for uh, other options which are available. So your redundancies are uh, reducing as uh, the situation progresses. So your backup, backups have failed and uh, you try to go for the bus. The neighbor informed that there's a bus strike. So the workaround you were thinking of is unavailable. Last option you say, okay, I'll catch the cab. But at the last minute, you won't get a cab and that too in the peak hour. So these are tightly coupled situations which basically increase the threat level or compromise safety. At the end of it, you basically have run out of all options and you call it off that somebody else be delegated to attend. And obviously that other person at the last minute cannot pitch at the same uh, level or enthusiasm or uh, the way you would like to pitch. And the meeting has a different outcome. So what can we learn from this if we try to analyze the whole situation is that there are some primary failures, a human error, everybody does, humans uh, do uh, fail at times because of various reasons, time pressure or work pressure. So here there was human error when uh, basically the pot was forgotten on the gas and it overflowed or the key was forgotten. Uh, then secondly, if we go uh, to the mechanical failure, then we have the neighbor's car and the environment, the bus strike, design of the system, that why was it, uh, why was the door lock designed such that if the key is forgotten inside, the door still locks. So that's a design failure. And uh, the taxi surge will happen. Uh, because of tight coupling, high pressure. So the procedures used. So these are all aspects which are common to safety and everyday life. So life is complex. Whatever we do, if we start breaking down every activity, it becomes complex. But normally we do actions without thinking. So there are certain set of rules. Uh, which we apply every day without thinking. So the brain, uh, we are uh, humans are basically cognitive misers. So we do not apply too many uh, actions. There are heuristics 
or rules which are pre-decided that we will do such things. Well, the brain only puts an effort wherein something, a new situation is there or where there is exactly a need to put in more effort. So otherwise the brain tries to conserve the energy and uh, we have a limited attention span. So if you look at safety in aviation over the years, uh, aviation basically started full throttle during the World War. At that time, there was a big need to develop Air Force and the aircrafts because that was a new means of uh, getting over, over the borders and uh, deep penetration into the other side. So uh, the aircrafts were developed, new aircraft, new machinery, new design. But there was not an opportunity, enough opportunity to test them out. The pilots were also new. They could not be trained. So everybody was still learning at that stage. So there were a lot of uh, hull losses, fatalities. Over a period of time, as aviation progressed, then those designs started uh, uh, basically being refined and the crew training improved. Most important was the development of the flight data recorder because all the designers and uh, the aviation authorities wanted to know that if an accident happened, why is it happening? because of some design feature or some other features. So these uh, flight data recorders and cockpit voice recorders were installed. So that helped them understand what, where the exact or the root causes. So that led to a sharp decline in the accident rates. So an analysis or a, a investigation basically looks at two things. One is the proximate cause of the accident. Second is the root cause. Proximate cause is the first thing, then why, why did the accident happen? So, but if you eliminate that cause, it does not mean that accident will not happen again because the root cause is something else. What triggers the accident is something else. If that is eliminated, then only we can eliminate uh, the cause of the accident. The cockpit design has changed uh, remarkably quite a bit over uh, the past uh, say a century, almost a century. This is a caravel design, 1952. All dials, mechanical flying, no autopilots, very few automation uh, devices, uh, no software. Everything was mechanical and humans were involved uh, in it. At uh, there were humans were on the top of it, if I may say. If we compare with the present fleet, we have the Airbus 350, or the new Boeings. So they're all software driven. Uh, enormous amount of automation, or if I may say over automated. So now uh, where does a human being lie in this situation? Earlier, the human being was in command. They used to fly the aircraft. Now automation is flying the aircraft. The pilots are basically considered as managers, cockpit managers. If something fails, or something out of the sequence, then the pilot comes in. But there is a different equation that the pilots have uh, begun to think that automation is the master. If something is happening, it must be right. But uh, it also is about the training. How do you train pilots about automation? Uh, there's a professor, very renowned professor, Parsuraman. So he has said that uh, we are basically teaching people how to operate, but we need to know about use of automation, disuse of automation, abuse of automation, and misuse of automation. So we need to know the whole uh, gamut of things because an automation is like another person with you. We have two autopilots in the aircraft. So they are also moody at times they work properly, at times they do not, they work intermittently or they misbehave. So with AI coming in, it is like another air, another person sitting in the aircraft or in the cockpit. So you need to understand the person, the behavior of the person, like we try to understand uh, the co-workers behavior. How would they react if uh, things go wrong or when they are under pressure? So getting back to... Uh, safety. Uh, so this is the progression basically. 
in the 1950s most of the failures were due to technical factors and then in the 70s it became human factors almost 80% of the accidents were due to human factors and very less due to technical factors and now we have started including organizational factors also so when we investigate there's a method called the fish bone wherein uh, we find the root cause by including all factors including all these three factors so what role do they play because an accident does not happen out of the blue there are always and there is a primary cause or the root cause then there are contributory causes which could have had they not existed could have acted as barriers to the errors which were being uh, passed on to different stages so the swiss cheese model is uh, typically used in aviation to study how accidents happen so a uh, cheese is basically in layers and it has holes in between when all the holes align then an error is able to pass through and an accident happens but if we misalign the holes then they act as barriers if there is an error happening in say on this slide organization error then at workplace it could be trapped or the people could trap it or we have defenses like uh, technology we have barriers created uh, mechanical barriers or training is also a defense and regulations so these holes need to be misaligned when all of them align means uh, people are not able to trap the errors and they pass through and then an accident happens so for this a detailed uh, analysis of investigation is required which happens after every accident and uh, the important part is that uh, the investigation which happens is not to pin blame it is only to find out the root cause so that another accident of this kind does not happen the concept of safety is basically threat error management so there are threats around errors happen but how do we manage so ultimately an aircraft is flying a pilot is flying the aircraft so any accident which happens means that the pilot was not able to handle the failure which was there which led an aircraft to a what we call undesirable state if an aircraft is flying within the envelope we call it envelope wherein uh, those are the acceptable parameters if it goes beyond the envelope then we call it undesirable state it could be a high pitch angle or too much bank or diving steeply climbing steeply so anything which goes beyond the normal range is an undesirable state but what was the threat which caused this and how did the error pass through so that uh, the aircraft reached such a state is uh, what is uh, basically safety in aviation so safety simply put is a condition where nobody gets harmed we have hazards internal and external anything which has a potential to cause harm is a hazard it becomes a threat so internal we have fatigue uh, experience attitude of people a lack of recency or proficiency health and well-being external is uh we have cabin crew air traffic controllers and maintenance so these are all hazards so somebody has to analyze this so there has to be a systematic way and uh, like i said safety first or safety last is not the issue safety is basically a balance between production and protection if there is too much production then at some stage you are compromising on protection okay. so that will lead to an accident but if there is too much protection if safety is on the higher side too high then it leads to lower production and which will lead to bankruptcy so safety has to balance the whole process uh earlier we used to have uh, the regulations in black and white that either we can do something or cannot do something which means if we do not qualify then the op- the procedure stops we do not fly or the aircraft cannot be dispatched now the whole process has changed it is risk based so if we analyze the risk and we say that uh, uh, we have considered all the issues 
with this operation, uh, the flight, and uh, these are the risks involved. Are these risks acceptable and how do we mitigate them? If they are able to be mitigated with certain uh, other defenses, uh, because we can offset certain risks by or compensate them. So then the uh, flight continues with acceptable level of risk. So that has to be again analyzed by a group. This is a shell model wherein in the middle we have the liveware or uh, the human being. So their interaction is between uh, uh, the borders. On the left, we have the software. Then on the top, we have hardware. On the right, we have environment. And below, we have another liveware. So human being to human being interaction is there. And we interact with all these four elements on a daily basis. The risk is basically the outcome. It is a product of uh, the probability of occurrence and the severity. So again, uh, there is a group in every company or organization which uh, sits down and analyzes the threats. So they have a sheet where they put and record all the threats. What is the probability of occurrence and what is the severity? Then we have a risk number. The risk number is compared to a risk matrix. If this operation is, or if the flight is, uh, if the risk level is acceptable, can it be continued with mitigation or should the flight be stopped? So the decision has to be taken based on a detailed risk analysis. For example, fatigue is a threat. So what is the risk of fatigue is an accident. Accidents have happened because of uh, fatigue. The final outcome is we have to keep the risk at a low, as low as reasonably, reasonably practicable level. Well, it cannot be zero. If you want to keep the risk zero, then rather not fly. So that is the safest way. For example, we carry fuel in the wings. So wings, the fuel in the wings, they are highly uh, uh, likely to catch fire. So they, they are hazards basically. But we have measures to keep them in a safe way, which means while refueling, we take certain precautions. Uh, in flight, we take certain precautions. We have a technology called fuel inerting systems, which removes the oxygen inside the tanks so that the probability of catching fire is less. So we have to keep our operation wherein the risk is as low as reasonably practicable and acceptable to the company and to the regulator. So the risk uh, number which comes is then compared to this matrix, wherein if you see at the bottom is the probability, unlikely, remote, occasional, certain and frequent. And on the left, we have uh, from the top catastrophic, major, serious, marginal, negligible. So if we say one in a million chance is unlikely and your uh, risk level is catastrophic, so then it is green. Basically, we can operate because the probability is very, very low. But if it is happening frequently, number five, and there's a serious uh, threat. So your risk number is 15, which is in the ember, which means you need some mitigation strategies. You cannot, you're not in the green. You cannot continue operation unless you take certain measures. So this is the way we handle uh, uh, safety and it's recorded. So threat and error is equal, equal to undesirable state. So threat has to be managed. If it is left unmanaged, that will lead to an or could lead to an accident incident. So another thing is errors. Errors also have to be managed. If unmanaged, again, they could lead to accident or incident. We have certain active and latent threats which means, like I said, the fuel is a latent threat. It is not doing anything unless disturbed. So if it is disturbed, it becomes active. So there are a number of latent threats which are there, which need to be identified. Because if there is a failure in a particular system, that could activate another latent threat that could become active. So we have to think of all scenarios wherein 
uh, suddenly the whole thing changes. Uh, I'll give you an example. Because everything does not work as per SOP. There was an aircraft taking off from uh, one of the airports in Iraq, a DHL cargo aircraft. So soon after takeoff, uh, the aircraft was hit by a missile uh, on the left wing. So the wing was damaged, there was a fuel leak and there was a fire. But uh, the pilots continued to keep the engine running because they lost all hydraulics, which basically take care of uh, your flight control systems, which helps the aircraft to turn and go up and down. So there are certain situations which do not have an SOP. So that is where your uh, conceptual understanding comes in of what is the threat, what is active, uh, which is latent, and uh, how to manage these things. So that is uh, training intervention. Safety is managed, by, managed through a system called safety management system, which has four basic pillars. Uh, the first one is policy. So everything has to be defined. There is a document from the regulator which and approved uh, for the operator, wherein your uh, policies are designed. Uh, the policies basically come from top to bottom, wherein the CEO or the accountable manager basically signs it. It's like the quality system. So the policy is there, then you have risk management. So like I said before, there is a, a team called a safety action group and over it is the safety review board. So safety action group is from every department. You have one or two people who will identify the threats in their system. For example, we have different uh, departments, flight operations, flight training, engineering, human resource, finance. So even a person from finance is also a part of the safety management system because there could be certain financial decisions which are taken, which could have impact on uh, the safety or training. So if you cut down training because of certain financial issues, then how does it impact your safety? Because training is a backup. Like I said, it is a barrier uh, for uh, the error to pass through. So it does not mean that if there is HR or finance, they are not in charge of or they do not have uh, any say in safety. So safety is ingrained in every activity and everybody is expected to be responsible and uh, in charge of safety. So not just the safety people or the safety department, but everybody in the operations uh, or in the uh, company is in charge. So risk management is hazard identification and uh, the risk calculation. Uh, investigations, we learn a lot from investigations. Uh, after an investigation, recommendations come in. So have we incorporated that? Is there any uh, SOP change which is required. So that comes in assurance, which is like a quality assurance. So there is a review period after six months or one year. We have to review that if we have made a change for change management. So did the change have the desired effect, what we intended to do? So if the SOP has been changed, so what was the reason for the change of the SOP? What were we trying to achieve? And after six months or the review period decided, we will again come back and see that did that SOP achieve the change which we were expecting? If not, then we again uh, carry out a risk assessment and uh, revise the SOP. And safety promotion is like uh, having uh, conferences and talks, uh, posters, so these things. So collectively, this is a safety management system because it is a systematic process. And there is a feedback loop, like a quality management system. And everything is documented. Uh, that is the best part, because then nobody can shy away. And you have a track of uh, how things are done in the past, were done in the past, and what is needed to be done in the future. Uh, we try to achieve in a safety system, the topmost, which is a generative safety system, wherein everybody feels responsible for their safety and safety of others. But generally an organization works on proactive or calculative safety. Bottom most is pathological safety, which means that uh, you will talk about safety only when you're caught. So if you're caught doing the wrong thing, then you say, okay, we'll correct our procedures we intend, our intention is to follow the safety regulations and all. 
So that is the bottom most wherein uh, you will not do anything for safety unless you are caught. So most organizations worked on proactive that they themselves do something or a lot of things for safety. But uh, culturally, it doesn't come. Like we have the Japanese culture wherein uh, people feel that the group is responsible. But on the other hand, we have other systems uh, like uh, the American culture wherein they are individually led. So individuals are more strong than the organization. But in the Eastern side, they try to uh, move as an organization and work towards the organization goal. So in safety, if everybody performs their role and uh, contributes, then obviously uh, it comes to the collective safety. But uh, it has to be led in a proper way by the top uh, through policies and action. So when we talk about safety, we have different types like informed culture. In the safety culture, informed culture is wherein you have the right people in the right place managing uh, safety. We have flexible culture wherein the organization is willing to listen and change things and is flexible. Uh, learning culture, you learn from accidents, incidents, from other organizations, from other industries. Uh, reporting culture is wherein you're basically uh, rewarded or uh, uh, the reporting system is such that there is ease of reporting and uh, the what uh, like the US in aviation has something called ASRS uh, a reporting system, which is open. Anybody can access the reports, but it is handled by a non-governmental organization. So, and uh, the database is open. The authorities take note of the uh, whatever people give feedback and reports. And uh, if there is a system improvement which has been suggested, then things happen from there. So that is a positive uh, reporting culture. And people are encouraged to report. It is not that we must report only when things go wrong. So before anything goes wrong, a person on ground will always come to know that, no, this is not working and it is likely to go wrong. That is where people are supposed to report so that uh, the higher ups come to know in advance and things can be, action can be taken well in advance. Now, the most important thing is the just culture, wherein uh, an innocent mistake is not treated the same as a violation. A violation is something that uh, a deliberate uh, non-compliance of regulation or rule or SOP. But everybody makes mistake and an innocent mistake is uh, basically let go and uh, the system is revised. So if there is an error which happens, the organization first looks inward that was there something in our SOP that uh, uh, this error happened or our systems, then they go towards the person and find out what happened. So that is the way just culture works in aviation. Uh, very quickly, this is an example of one accident, a very old accident in uh, Chicago, a DC-10 aircraft. Just after takeoff, uh, it went into a steep bank and crashed. So they were very... Uh, uh, the very intriguing accident because it took the investigators a lot of time to find out what exactly happened. Even the flight data recorder, its electrical supply was cut off basically, so they couldn't get much. So ultimately, it boiled down to a nut, so this size. So uh, this nut sheared off, which caused this accident. So it was a chain of actions which happened. Uh, the certain procedure which was not followed for mounting the engine of the aircraft on the wing. Uh, so basically the engine is mounted on the wing uh, pylon and this nut basically holds the engine. And uh, the procedure was not followed, this nut sheared off and then there was a uh, series of uh, uh, kind of failures which happened in other systems which led to this accident. So organizational lapses that uh, while there are SOPs, a lot of organizations develop their own SOPs uh, workaround to do things. So 
that is one of the contributory cause human error basically the forklift operator the operator who is supposed to lift the engine towards the pylon so if he does uh, something which is not in the sop or if he uh, if uh, he basically in this case uh, it was a uh, a loading error a minor loading error which uh, along with other errors caused this accident and then flawed assumptions like the airplane design uh, we have slats on the wings on the front edge of the wings there are certain devices which extend when we take off that is so that the aircraft can uh, climb at a steep angle and did not stall so what happened in this case was that the airplane designers assumed that once the hydraulic power pressurizes and the slats are extended on the leading edges so they will not retract there will not be a situation so that was the flawed assumption in this case one of them retracted that caused the aircraft go into a steep bank so this is a final thing what we call a normal accident theory so certain other accidents have happened because of very minute or minuscule reasons but they were major accidents so normal accident theory is basically that uh, there are certain situations wherein we say that this accident was inevitable it had to happen that is basically because of tightly coupled systems and complexities when the system becomes too complex and uh, there are a lot of actions which are performed in a very short interval which we call tightly coupled then there are uh, chances that an accident is very likely to happen so that is called a normal accident theory so we are not surprised that this accident happened it was uh, destined to happen so system designers are not able to understand or anticipate these interactions because on a aircraft there are multiple systems electrical hydraulic air driven so and we have computers which talk to each other one computer fails what will be the interaction on the or reaction on the other computer or a certain combination which happens so that is very difficult to uh, ascertain only over a period of time 10 20 years the things are basically ironed out for a new aircraft so we have complexity and tightly coupling so this tight coupling situation is there in every uh, uh industry and we have seen it in uh, high risk industries like nuclear and uh, oil and gas uh, aviation we see that we have check certain checklists to be performed so checklists are basically barriers that certain critical items should not be missed out because when we are doing something there could be distractions or there could be a rush time pressure so that checklist is a kind of a barrier uh, for uh, such situations so whenever there is a high risk situation basically you need to decouple or space out things and slow down a lot of uh, aviation accidents have happened in a rush so that is why we call it get home itis so in a rush to get home or to land the aircraft so uh, pilots have pushed the situation to a stage where they have uh, either uh, overrun the runway or others uh, controlled flight into terrain accidents so this is the graph which shows uh, the interaction between complexity and uh, tight coupling so with the high risk industry nuclear space missions high complexity you need to uh, decouple so you have to become low mode loose rather than become tight when you think it comes tight it comes uh, pretty risky uh, mindfulness is one thing uh, and uh, which i'm very proud of the indian thing which is now being used in lot of air force like norwegian air force and all uh, for the fighter pilots so that they achieve a better score at uh, uh, their targets so before the flight they do a lot of mindfulness and breathing activities in aviation also 
uh, we some call some things called uh, startle and surprise so certain situations startle us and uh, the pilots freeze for a few seconds post that when they come out of the startle or during the startle they may uh, make some inputs on the flight controls which may put the aircraft in a undesirable state in a bank or a steep climb or a dive uh, because of the startle surprises when we have a plan of action and that doesn't work so we are surprised why didn't it work so our mind is again distracted into why this did not happen rather than flying the aircraft so an aircraft is like uh, uh, for example we have finite amount of fuel so unlike the road if we have a flat tire we can park the car and change the tire in a flight anything happens the flight must continue because there there is finite amount of fuel and we are flying so we cannot pause or slow down things so uh, it has to be managed through effective uh, we call it crew resource management through communication amongst the uh, all the stakeholders for example the cabin crew the air traffic controller so whatever resource you can get from the manuals you have to get it and uh, then take a decision on the outcome of the flight so to conclude basically safety is about humans so ultimately we are involved in it and uh, human machine interface experts also say that for every failure that a human being does there is no need to come out with a engineering barrier or control rather than we might as well fix the human instead of coming up with more automation and more softwares so first there's a need to fix the human being and the way they think and their uh, deficiencies uh, managing organizations is now a big issue because it has an impact on the individual and groups so uh, the awareness is coming that organization also play an important part in the safety culture of, of an individual and organization and finally mindfulness and breathing are the key elements to uh, achieving safety in aviation thank you very much for that thank you captain amit singh thanks a lot for the wonderful uh, i would say introduction uh, to all anesthetists who are listening here about uh, what safety is how a safety culture works especially in the aviation industry we'll come back with questions uh, and i've got a message here to all the delegates who are tuned in uh, there's a q and a box which is uh, in the bottom part of the screen so any questions for uh, the three speakers of this evening you can kindly post it there and we'll take it after the talks uh, dr so, murli you can also make an announcement that a lot of people are saying that they find it difficult to log in with the qr code or the zoom link so they can watch in the anesthesia tv also yes it was probably my mistake not to kind of probably put everything there i put the qr code thinking it will be easier uh, so for for those who are finding it difficult to log in as uh, dr bala has mentioned uh, we are live on youtube on anesthesia tv on facebook and on anesthesia tv website so you can tune in directly there and you can post your questions there which will be collated to the questions here so moving on uh, we have our next speaker uh, who doesn't require much of introduction it is dr sunil pandya uh, so to just a brief intro about uh, what dr sunil pandya has done uh, he is a chief of uh, the department of anesthesia perioperative medicine and critical care at uh, AIG hospitals uh, in uh, uh, Hyderabad and also Fernandez hospitals he is the founder director of uh, PACCS health care private limited which presently has a team strength of uh, more than 400 anesthetists and is in the 27th year of uh, team practice his areas of interest are uh, critical care uh, mainly in the maternal and surgical area anesthesia and analgesia for high risk obstetrics Uh, clinical audits and dashboards has been a pioneer with regards to audit systems in india and also uh, an advocate for patient safety and uh, patient satisfaction amongst his uh, many achievements he is a gold medalist in md anesthesia he has been an immediate uh, past president of the association of obstetric anesthetists of india and an immediate past secretary of society of obstetric medicine He is an instructor for many courses such as the ATLS, uh, ACLS, CTLS, also and FCCS. He has received the ISA Bhopal Award in 2021, the KOPS Best Paper Award four times, and also has got many awards internationally. 
he has many uh, original innovations in patient safety and also has multiple publications and more than 300 lectures in national and international meetings so thanks for joining us sir and uh, i will hand over the stage to you uh, to speak about patient safety in private practice thank you sir thank you dr murli for the kind uh, introduction and uh, i think probably long uh, resume uh, but importantly i enjoyed listening to dr mr captain uh, amit uh, for the fantastic opening uh, presentation in fact it is very good to hear uh, aviation expert view point on uh, uh, safety of the passengers and the crew and the personnel uh, probably go uh, hand in hand with what we do in our anesthetic practice so next 20 minutes i shall be sharing what uh, how we have evolved uh, establishing safety in our practice in a private practice and uh, uh, the goals of uh, future and the future directions <clears throat> So the learnings during our postgraduate training in anesthesia, and during postdoctoral fellowship training, we realized that anesthesiology is a high risk specialty as it has the potential to induce extreme physiological responses that sometimes can become pathological and can endanger patients' life. And as an anesthesiologist, uh, we have to be prepared. Uh, Twenty, I mean, uh, every time we induce a patient for anesthesia, to tackle them with uniform strategies. Uh, importantly. crisis situations are relatively uncommon but often unpredictable and we all need to be prepared to tackle them as and when they arise and in a high risk uh, center complex series of patient they are relatively more frequent importantly anticipation and standardization of anesthesia care plan to a large extent mitigate uh, these issues and we can enhance perioperative patient safety and importantly audits and updating the standards is a continuum uh, process that is what we learned during our uh, training in anesthesia and uh, coming to our practice as a team we started way back in february 1997 with two hospitals uh, surgical oncology center and obstetric uh, center and we started with a six bedded uh, surgical icu uh, in one hospital and on demand 24 into 7 labor epidural services at fernandez hospital uh just to give an insight to to, to captain amit uh, uh, labor epidural services are the painless deliveries in a healthy pregnant woman and uh, epidural technique is considered to be angel most of the time but on some occasions it can be devil also and we had read several several case reports of epidural being devil and we are always a uh, little uh, uh, frenzy about it and we thought we have to be always on the angel side the motto of our team practice was to provide comprehensive and safe anesthetic and critical care services as a team which we had just begun so when we entered as a team at fernandez hospital in february 1997 the management was very keen that we establish a painless delivery 24 into 7 and uh, the first month the labor epidural acceptance uh, when we started we didn't give a single epidural it was 0% and the management thought that we are not very competent honestly yes we had done a lot of uh, epidurals in non pregnant patient but pregnant patient we didn't do uh, much of epidurals and we thought we should just study the pattern and the personnel before we venture into the new uh, innings and subsequently once we had enough grasp for a month we observed the different parameters the acceptance the second month was 37% the third month the painless delivery acceptance was 51% and to date we have never dropped below 50% so what we did uh, uh, because basically we wanted uh, zero tolerance to any adverse effects so what we did in the first month importantly was just studied the hospital it was a new experience for us because we had never done any heart for obstetrics especially epidural uh, outside our pg training and uh, importantly uh, it was a new atmosphere to uh, work with almost about 15 20 obstetric uh, consultants uh, around and uh, we know that high pitch uh, uh, labor rooms and uh, uh, we we know the uh, emergencies number of several emergencies so we thought we should not venture out do something which we are not very acclimatized to so we just studied the hospital uh, studied the personnel established the purchase of safety equipment because when we realized that 
that the major safety equipment like defibrillator, basic patient monitor, the resuscitation cart were not there. It is not that Fernandez Hospital did not have epidural services. Epidural board were being given admission earlier also, but it was the individual protocol of the uh, respective person. They used to carry uh, medications for resuscitation in their pockets or in, in the box, and they used to take home when they went home. So, but there was never a established system to uh, for patient safety. So we established these things. We read and discussed and developed basic protocols of providing labor and services because we didn't want to venture out. So uh, it was a new thing for us. And importantly, we put some basic risk management strategies of uh, uh, managing high spinals, total spinals, which can be life-threatening to the patient. Uh, uh, simultaneously, next year, within a year's time, we established a full-fledged services. And uh, next year, that's 1998, we established a dedicated optic critical care unit and the complexity of cases started increasing. The complexity is high risk cases started uh, uh, getting admitted to ICU. And so also the critically sick patients started coming to hospital. And we had to tackle several unanticipated major life-threatening blood loss. Uh, and importantly, patients with uh, multi-organ dysfunction syndrome. And we had to sit down on the desk, along with obstetricians, redefined uh, protocols, evolved protocols, uh, developed blood procurement policies because we almost had uh, near uh, misses uh, on two occasions where we nearly lost the patient because of total exsanguination. And then we had to, uh, because there was no protocol of procuring blood on a massive scale when they bleed and how to obtain additional because when we started the team, it was just six of us uh, and uh, uh, somebody was positive, somebody was in another hospital and to get additional help was difficult. And importantly, yes, we expanded the team, included research and weekly academic schedule, incorporated that. So basically the basic idea was read and learn and reading was a continuous process. So also learning was a continuous process. And we also introduced clinical audits in uh, 1998. 2000 was a landmark year because uh, briefly I had been to UK as an observer. And I was gifted two beautiful books. Uh, one was Why Mothers Die. Uh, I read the entire book in a single day. And it was a fantastic book to read because we got to know the true nature of why mothers die during delivery. And especially uh, my areas of concern was anesthetic uh, uh, aspect. And I read that chapter as the first chapter. And we all incorporated those risk management strategies that have led to a death of a mother in the United Kingdom. And that's how the audit, uh, actually true audit part started. Similarly, one of my patients also gifted me, uh, me uh, annual refresher, uh, AS refresher course. And I was fascinated by one of the chapter, which was a closed claim analysis, American Society of Anesthesiology closed claim analysis, where they have done the audit of all the patients who had sued the uh, medical personnel and they won the cases and the files were closed. And when they analyzed, they got to know the mistakes they made and the risk management strategies that were important. So these two chapters led to a lot of innovations and development. And we, uh, our own by then, we had an audit of followers about 5,000 cases in our hospital. We found a lot of avoidable errors. And in the same way, we also had one perimodal disease in delivery, so which was significant learning for us. And we structured our proper audit program uh, in our hospital. Not only the department policies, but we got together as a hospital, including as uh, Mr. Captain Amit said rightly, involved in the organization, the administration, the finance uh, also, because uh, finance, why finance was involved is uh, one of the finance team person came and said, sir, you have not used defibrillator last one year. And how do you build the patient? So... I told the finance guy, West, don't force us to use defibrillator because that's a life-saving equipment. It has to be there. Basically, they are naive people. So uh, they have no idea. They have no clue. They think that whenever they invest in something, there has to be some ROI. And certain things, yes, ROI is uh, impregnated into the uh, hospital infrastructure uh, planning. So that's how the admin uh, came into picture. And we put certain protocols which are system-driven rather than personal-driven. Because before that, it was a personal driven uh, protocols. Then we tried to put system driven protocols as respect to who is there at the helm of affairs. System should run flawlessly and upgraded the protocols. SOPs were made again. And we included a culture of no blame strategy because we wanted each one of our colleagues to report 
any error they commit uh, during their practice uh, and encourage documentation errors. Uh, there was one error which I would like to highlight. Uh, it was me who was on duty uh, that particular night and uh, it was a patient with uh, uh, hypertension complicating pregnancy like severe hypertension and uh, I decided to give a regional analysis, I'll explain analysis in the back. So we can't hear you. Um, we can see the screen, but we can't hear you. So it looks like a network issue at uh, Sir's end. Uh, we'll just wait for uh, five, 10 seconds. Sure. Because, uh, the screen, I think we can see the screen. So obviously, uh, I think screen is off. Could be a power cut issue, sir. Power cut, okay. In which case, I think uh, what we will do is, uh, uh, Bala, sir, if you don't mind, can we just take a couple of questions uh, till uh, he comes back? And if he doesn't, then we can continue with your presentation. Yeah, right? sure. Yes. Uh, Captain Amit, uh, I just had a couple of questions which, uh, you know, based on your talk. Now, one, I found it very interesting, especially when it came to the... Uh, safety culture of having the flexible learning, just, you know, informed and reporting culture. Now, what was done in the airline industry uh, to uh, encourage reporting? Because that is something which we find uh, in medical uh, you know, industry very difficult for uh, people to accept mistakes or to tell that there was an error. So there's anything from aviation that we can learn to improve reporting or reporting culture? For example, uh, we have something called uh, a go-round, which means uh, when an aircraft is approaching to land and uh, for whatever reason the pilot decides uh, to discontinue the approach and carry out the go-round and try another approach. So it is very clearly said that thing will not be investigated because go-round is considered to be a safety maneuver, that there was something which the pilot thought or somebody thought that was not correct or would have could have led to an incident. So when somebody uh, does a go around, why did that happen? So that thing is not investigated. So it is basically the confidence of the people that uh, is there. So one, uh, I think it has to be a multi-pronged strategy. One uh, uh, strategy will not work. Like we cannot say that uh, no action will be taken. It is basically you have to establish the trust between uh, the different parties. Uh, for example, uh, 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 we were making the SOP. Uh, when we make SOP, we have to check uh, how uh, the flight data of the past uh, one year or whatever period of time is there. What are the issues? What are the issues uh, which basically affect your operations? So. Uh, normally, what happens is the senior management or the senior uh, trainers, they get together and make their SOPs. But it has to be implemented by people on ground. So if you involve people on ground, like the regular pilots who fly every day, so they feel empowered that they are being consulted in policy and decision making. So when they are being consulted, invariably it is an indirect way of putting responsibility on them. They feel responsible and uh, they automatically enhance safety and start reporting. So another option is ease of reporting. Like I said, uh, it should not be a big uh, a form. A form has to be filled out and it has to go through certain motions. It basically needs to be a simplistic form and reaches the person addressed in the fastest way. And the last is that there has to be some outcome of it. If people keep reporting and there is no feedback or change or any outcome, people stop reporting. So uh, first is involve people, ease of reporting, and then give a feedback to them that we have your feedback. And these were the changes which were because of your reporting. So then they feel empowered and motivated. So unless a person is motivated, uh, this reporting culture will decline. 
So these are the few steps which the airlines take uh, to promote the uh, reporting culture. Thank you, thank you, sir. In fact, uh, uh, Dr. Sunil Pandey has joined us, sir. Taking off from the last line on your of your slide, we yeah. thought you had some issues technically, either a power cut or uh, you know the computer. Yeah, I think there was a sudden loss of internet actually. Okay. Yes. So yeah. I took I, I took the last point of your slide and uh, I was uh, asking Captain Amit Singh as to how they. Uh, ensure reporting culture in airline industry. So over to you, uh, uh, Sunil, sir. I think we'll let you kind of continue your presentation. Uh, apologies uh, for the disruption. But yes, uh, as the captain said rightly, we uh, introduced no blame strategy and then we should document it. And that's how the real improvement started. And we started reading a lot about critical incidents and near missiles in anesthesia. And we came across this beautiful paper uh, written by uh, Fanagan in 1954. Uh, again, it was from aviation where it was, it was used to reduce the loss of military pilots and aircraft during uh, uh, training. And subsequently, it was this gentleman, Jeffrey Cooper, in 1978. He introduced uh, critical incident training into anesthesia as a method to study errors during administration of anesthesia. And the Harvard Medical Safety Foundation was started by these four gentlemen. Again, uh, basically, the Massachusetts General Hospital uh, Biomedical Unit, and you have this uh, uh, talk flow of Jeffrey Cooper, Ronald Newborn, and Edwin Trotman, who established the safety foundation at uh, Harvard Medical School. And the anesthesia safety started with the precedent from uh, the borrowing the principles from the aviation uh, safety. And this was one of those early paper in 19, I mean, 2002, probably this paper got published in 1978, the study of human factors. And, and we know that one of the leading cause of uh, uh, mishaps are the humans. And as uh, uh, Captain rightly put it, uh, safety is all about uh, humans. We'll be discussing more about it later, later on. But this is what the papers are uh, Cooper by, I mean, uh, paper by uh, Jeffrey Cooper was uh, establishing clinical critical incident uh, uh, training in anesthesia, which was which is now very widely accepted worldwide globally, and we too uh, enhanced our audit by introducing the five prong process of identification, the assessment, there is root cause analysis, mitigation, monitoring, reporting, and the, uh, we, we sort of more or less standardized our uh, uh, audit uh, collecting process. Yeah, and the critical incidents that were reported in the literature, especially the ASA closed claim studies, were mostly uh, peri-operative events uh, like cardiac arrest, re-intubation, so on and so forth. But importantly, we added few more uh, in obstetrics, especially regional anesthesia, like total spinal, high spinal seizures and other things, uh, so that we can capture the data properly. And also the most common, uh, uh, certain relatively less common, common uh, adverse events like PDBH and uh, the modalities of treatment of PDBH so that we can have our own data over a time. And we know the treatment modalities uh, because literature says something and our data also was more or less corresponding with what the literature says. Uh, and that's how we started improving our standards of care towards our patient. So we started uh, changing the focus at a macro level. Department personnel to uh, interdepartmental meetings uh, at admin level meetings, and uh, because we know that uh, critical incidents or mishaps, it happens at a uh, because of multifactorial uh, reasons. Mostly, it could be patient related factors. The patient is not sent for PSC in advance, or just you do PSC just before surgery, or there is improper communication between the surgeon and the anesthetist, and a high risk patient is uh, missed from uh, preoperative screening, and uh, we don't evaluate properly, or we don't have proper time to evaluate. So these are uh, multifactorial uh, issues we could find out from our uh, 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 data, and that's when we started looking at a uh, macro level, and we started improving uh, overall at a at a macro level. And of course, we came across this uh, acronym of STOP, STOP or STAR, where when you have a crisis or when you have a per perioperative incident, uh, basically don't uh, come out of the fixation error. Take a breath, observe and reflect and proceed with more awareness or call for help uh, early. And yes, anesthesia is nothing but equipment heavy, infrastructure heavy uh, specialty. And we are surrounded by multi 
monitors, the anesthesia workstations, the anesthesia monitors, the surgeons monitors, and we need to monitor not only our monitors, but also the surgeons monitors and the surgeons hands also. And that, that's where we have to be uh, eternally vigilant. And uh, we try to develop uh, uh, designs, I mean, uh, pre-operative check, uh, all those things were incorporated in our practice. And calling for appropriate help when there is crisis, that, is, that was the most important thing. And we initiated a dedicated PSC clinic and antenatal counseling uh, clinic that this was in 2000, so that all patients, irrespective of whether they need surgery or not, they come for screening and we see them, we counsel them. And if at all they need surgery, we put down proper anesthesia plan, management plan, reassessment of airway, because we know that uh, in pregnancy, the airway is one of the most challenging part of the uh, anesthetic uh, management. And uh, that is one crucial thing that uh, we always do because uh, uh, most of the mishaps in the close claim studies are because of airway related hypoxic brain injury. And uh, we incorporated a 3M uh, concept. Uh, checking of machine, checking of monitors and medications. Most importantly, uh, medications, uh, uh, labeling, mislabeling, inappropriate labeling re related to errors have happened where like atropine and atracurium, some of, most of our technicians, they're at ATR, ATR, atropine, atracurium. So those, those we started standardizing the uh, labeling patterns also so that uh, minimizing errors at every level and uh, reassess additional backup equipment of course, now it is there in surgical safety checklist, but we introduced our audits. This is one of those old audit. Uh, I just uh, took this snapshot of this picture, which was in May 2002. If you see on the right hand side, the anesthesia problem, wherein ineffective epidural, reciting, dural punctures, multiple attempts, uh, failed epidural, I mean, uh, unplanned intubation. Uh, delayed recovery, all those things have been captured. We started capturing manually. We didn't have a software. And we did attempt to develop a software in 2005, but uh, we failed because uh, the software guy was could not uh, we could not get the result. It was taking him less time, and we continued uh, manual manual uh, data processing. And subsequently, of course, now we have a uh, Excel. Uh, we capture the data on Excel sheet. We also introduced the introspection part uh, in our register. Like this was a huge, this register is there in all the hospitals at workplaces, wherein uh, any uh, unexpected, uh, undue, uh, uh, unique experience, critical incident, and how to improve further, how to avoid in future, and uh, is it uh, implemented, and so on and so forth. These things got implemented uh, in early 2000, and that's how we started improving our practice and minimizing adverse effects further. Simultaneously, yes, continuous thrust was uh, given on scientific presentations, workshops, and data analytics. Uh, as the team became big, the human factor issues increased. The communication uh, lapses also started creeping in, and we had to standardize the recruitment policy process because earlier randomly whoever whenever the anesthetist was needed they used to uh, 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 take interview at a local level and they started employing without uh, checking the credentials so we started uh, standardize the recruitment policy hand holding supervision credentialing very very important uh, and uh, we started uh, strategizing the posting also like when an anesthetist is recruited especially at Fernandez hospital we don't give them a laboring patient. We start. We give them elective case for a spinal anesthesia. Then we see the technique. We see the uh, uh, the uh, confidence level, and then slowly uh, they, they take them to labor room, and then give them a laboring patient for epidural. So we had our, our own internal system of uh, uh, incorporating a patient safety protocol, and of course, focused closer communication was established uh, in uh, again early two thousand. Uh, S bar introduced. Uh, basically, we got to know about S bar when we attended ACLS uh, provided and subsequent in, uh, instructor course also. Uh, every patient death gives a lot of information to for us, like a, a aircraft uh, accident that gives a lot of uh, uh, analytics from the flight data recorder. Similarly, every patient death gives us a lot of information about the preventive strategies and if at all the death was uh, uh, that could have been prevented. And we started having this uh, serious introspection session within 48 hours after the major morbidity and mortality and the foundations of uh, patient safety were enhanced. And of course, uh, simultaneously, as I said, the scientific 
sessions, workshops, uh, fellowship course, more reading, more implementation of uh, standards uh, continued. And improved team dynamics. As the team became bigger, we had to have a common platform so that everybody uh, syncs in the similar way. And uh, uh, we started uh, having uh, more uh, team meetings, huddles uh, before major cases, huddles before complex cases. So that, uh, like for example, just to give an example, if I'm uh, doing a patient who has uh, cirrhosis of liver for a cesarean section, uh, we ask the anesthetist, okay, in case if this patient has a GI bleed, what do you do? Uh, then they say, yes, uh, sinks taken tube. Many of them must not have introduced sinks taken tube in their life. But, okay, we have sinks taken tube, but if you don't know how to insert in emergency, it means uh, uh, doesn't make any sense. So we started uh, anticipating issues, anticipating problem, and started developing protocols of minimizing and mitigating the risk. Similarly, if uh, uh, like huddle of a cardiac parturient, like a patient with a serious heart disease coming for cesarean section, and if this patient has a postpartum hemorrhage, how are you going to give uh, utrotonic agents, like the medications that prevent uh, uh, tonicity of the uterus? Because we know that all these medications have tendency to worsen the cardiac diseases. And if you don't have clarity of mind, okay, this uh, oxytocin causes uh, SVR reduction, it causes uh, tachycardia, it is not uh, indicated in a patient with severe uh, cardiomyopathy, and that confusion should not be there. So what we have done in the hurdle is, Whenever you're taking any problematic case, routine case, anticipate common problem because of the disease entity, because of the comorbidities, because of interaction of anesthesia between disease and comorbids, and how to mitigate them and put down on the paper so that it becomes a cognitive weight and it becomes easy for you to manage. And that's that's how the team dynamics and hurdles have uh, uh, improved or uh, uh, enhanced our patient safety. Importantly, as we grew, we also started embracing the newer monitors and tools uh, uh, when, because when there is a high risk, don't shy away from uh, using the newer tools and newer monitors, which helps us in guiding appropriate uh, targeted therapy. Like this is the patient with severe heart disease and we have connected a, a flow track uh, monitor. How gathering uh, and auditing data helps us in our practice. This was a classic case when I presented a paper on non-invasive ventilation in pregnancy, uh, pregnant patients respiratory failure in a critical care conference in 2010. And the critical care expert from UK, I remember, doctor, you are killing a patient by putting an IV. Uh, do you have any evidence? I said then for probably we had almost about 400 cases. It was not published. Uh, the data was not published. Then I said, it is quite safe option. Then uh, we know that the published literature was just for four cases. And uh, today we know that NIV is a safe option in pregnancy. And our own data has proved that now we have more than 1,000 cases of non-invasive ventilation in pregnancy. If you follow certain protocol, the risk of aspiration is virtually uh, very, very minimal. So uh, basically, auditing your data, and if you audit your data properly, that can become a... Uh, gold mine for your subsequent uh, safety protocol. The only thing is, yes, it requires a publication and, a, and peer review and a long series so that uh, before you say that, yes, this procedure is absolutely safe in this patient with this disease condition, that is very important. Other thing which is uh, important is, uh, similarly, we develop protocols for a patient with a placenta ectodus spectrum who introduced internal balloon catheters for the first time uh, probably in the state. And we also noted that with this intervention, the bleeding was minimized, definitely. But on the contrary, some of the patients developed thrombotic complications. And how to detect thrombosis, we developed a protocol for that. And then uh, subsequently, we innovated, uh, we got all of the uh, catheter manufacturers to innovate the operational volume catheter so that uh, basically the clot formation occurred proximal to the balloon when the balloon was inflated in the internal iliac and with, uh, because of the of blood, there was a clot formation and we thought just one hole there and you, if you uh, put a saline, pressure saline bag, uh, there is a continuous pressure of saline and thrombus can be prevented. We innovated these new things and uh, by then, yes, newer techniques came in. But what I mean to say is by closely observing your own data, you can come up with new innovations and that's what uh, 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 implemented. And similarly, we conducted one first workshop on critical incident analysis in 2009 
and we also floated a critical incident registry for the hyderabad state i mean hyderabad telangana state unfortunately it didn't didn't take up only we were the only ones who were putting the data and subsequently it fizzled out but importantly we entered into ot designing icu designing infrastructure planning because uh, we realized that there are certain criticalities where uh, designing of theater designing of icu is very important to prevent environment related issues which can be or which can influence uh, patient mobility and in 2010 we introduced a dashboard audit uh, and we introduced clinical risk management which is a multi departmental this was one thing that has uh, led to inter departmental inter departmental protocol uh, basically anybody any staff it could be nursing staff it could be housekeeping staff it could be uh, doctors nurses anybody can put any complaint about uh, any doctor any nurse without uh, with anonymity and the data will be analyzed and this has helped tremendously because the newer protocol came and uh, we developed robust risk management strategies uh, uh, both in ob as well as anesthesia and of course as a part of minimizing errors reading from literature we eliminated uh, potassium chloride and pure sulfuric acid acid keeping in the theater more out of theater because we didn't want any serious medical uh, issues because there have been instances where instead of saline KCL was injected epidurally to identify uh, epidural space uh, in, in a case report, and we thought we should not uh, repeat because sometimes local lags and sonar lags medication errors uh, can happen. And this is what uh, the dashboard looks like. Almost more than ninety-three perioperative parameters, and as Captain said rightly, we we have standardized the data. Like we, the the red is the international standard, uh, uh, the and the red is national standard. orange is international standard and green is our standard and uh, i am I'm, i'm proud to say that today we are at par with the uh, international standards uh, in terms of uh, patient outcome and we presented this data in uh, the soap international meeting which has uh, incidentally got the uh, best paper award so basically uh simulation is also been introduced as a part of uh, patient training in our practice uh, and crisis management and this was one of the best innovation that was possible we introduced the simulation in 2008 and subsequently it has been an annual affair and it need not be a high fidelity uh, simulator but it can be a low fidelity simulator also or it can just be a case based discussion uh, or simulation based uh, case based discussion but that has helped us uh, humongously especially tackling uh, complex cases in the perioperative period and uh, that has been a major boon and subsequently standardization of practice and we produce our manual uh, in critical care manually in labor analgesia uh, basically it is uh, our own experience and we have borrowed certain international protocols also uh, which includes most of the checklist and uh, importantly what we call as a, a standard manual uh, again crisis management the common things that we uh, uh, want obstetricians to know about uh, anesthesia and perioperative period we started involving them also in our classes and vice versa wherein we taught them about uh, the resuscitation and they taught us about basics of ctgs and uh, it was a joint meeting uh, and uh, basically uh, these workshops uh, are conducted uh, every 6 uh, months in you know, hospital where a combined obstetrician and anesthetist come on a single platform and we discuss we tell them about uh, our concerns and they tell their about their concerns and uh, that's when uh, uh, uh basically we can build the intra departmental uh, uh connect uh, rigidly properly so that we can minimize uh, departmental interpersonal uh, relative issues uh and this is one simple tool uh, where we developed again uh, uh tools to reduce or minimize uh, peripartum perioperative complications uh, like this was a multi uh, obstetric early warning chart that was introduced basically invention from uk but we modified to our needs and if you see uh, by implementing this chart we could reduce the incidence of renal dysfunction pulmonary edema to almost statistically significant levels uh, by implementing appropriate tool because when you are monitoring the patient and appropriate tools are employed to minimize or to uh, anticipate the event properly you can trigger appropriate pathway the sepsis pathway hemorrhage pathway hypertension pathway or cardiopulmonary pathway and stabilize the patient and pull out the patient from the crisis so development of tools are 
very very important similarly development of uh, protocols for peripartum eclampsia i mean we know that uh, seizures in pregnancy are eclampsia but uh, that can be beyond eclampsia and that's what we we developed this uh, protocol of uh, algorithmic approach uh, and stat cesarean sections one of the very thing very 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 peculiar thing about obstetric is uh, stat surgery stat surgery is the moment the surgeon takes a decision the baby has to be pulled out and there's a humongous stress uh, on the part of anesthetist because they have to provide anesthesia safely and not infrequently we have a lady with uh, uh, 150 kilo patient with a uh, very difficult airway and difficult back and if you have to give anesthesia safely and the baby has to pull out within 15 minutes we audited our own data and uh, subsequently we developed a system of intimation communication that whenever this bell rings in theater or in anesthesia room uh, everybody gets alerted otherwise the uh, labor room receptionist calls anesthetist calls nurses and sometimes you waste time so uh, we have developed a bell uh, which is run from the labor room and within two minutes the all the personnel the neonatologists the anesthetists the nurses they open up they are ready in the theater and uh, that has saved some tremendous amount of time uh, to reach theater but importantly we audited the data of stat cesarean section and we realized that, uh, yes, small chunk of women, they need 15 minutes interval, but to a large extent, we have got 75 minutes. So there is no need to panic. And uh, uh, so, and that's what uh, your internal audit uh, helps us. Similarly, Robson's audit also we did and we, we propose that category one can be divided into one A and one B, where one A can be 15 minutes and one B can be up to 75 minutes. So there is no need to rush if it is one B. And similarly, Robson's 1A, of course, there's not an but we, we came out with this uh, classification also. Uh, we developed these cognitive aids. Again, these are all uh, the things that are there in the literature. But it is very difficult uh, for a youngster, for a fresher to remember whenever there is a block uh, that does not wear off. Like if I'm giving an epidural or a spinal, the block does not wear. Uh, the dermatomal mapping is very, very essential because we have had few scares of uh, delayed uh, uh, block uh, recovery after epidural almost patient took 16 hours and we are a little uh, worried about uraxial hematoma and other things and we developed this dermatome but fortunately uh, uh, zero we are clear on that slate or those on that type of complication so a continuous quality improvement is what the goal of our team is and i won't say zero risk but it is zero tolerance to risk of injuries from anesthesia uh, root cause analysis and care of your colleague also we developed like care of second victim many times uh, uh, we have had a couple of cases of perimortem cesarean delivery uh, patient gave a very short time but our anesthetist who was there on duty was depressed because uh, sometimes the patient could not be revived or sometimes the baby could not be revived uh, and uh, so care of your colleague during this crisis is also is very important um, document all adverse events that is uh, and reporting uh, is also very very important orientation of department policies especially when you have a new personnel joining induction program is mandatory never put him on duties alone uh, at least till he is familiar with all the procedures and protocols uh, and of course uh, handoff checklist uh, uh, and all these things uh, we started developing uh, this was a safe handover approach we almost implemented 10 years ago uh, wherein uh, if you see uh, sick patients in ICU at risk of major optic hemorrhage or uh, anesthetic problems, follow-ups of uh, patients, complications like PDPH, etc. and epidurals uh, who are actually a laboring patient. This is basically a safe handover we developed in patients, I mean our colleagues who are on duty from 6 p.m. to 8 a.m. onwards and uh, uh, so next day morning when the handover is done, everybody knows that uh, uh, who are all the sick patients who are at risk of hemorrhage and follow-up. So it becomes easy. So handoffs, uh, checklists are very, very important uh, so that we don't miss out on any at-risk patient. So just to summarize, this is the uh, statistics of last uh, uh, 22 years at uh, Fernandez Hospital. And uh, just uh, to look at the data of uh, uh, the quality indicators for uh, painless deliveries, if you see uh, the Certain on the left hand side, the uh, certain uh, like resetting conversions, accidental dual puncture, and this <coughs> is the data of a hospital. And if we compare this, uh, uh, like neurological issues of dual punctures, epidural blood patch, high block problems with GA, 
uh, what we do is every year we collect the statistics. In fact, every month and month and month we collect that statistics, and we compare with uh, the Royal College of Anesthetists. And this is where uh, our data is, and this is where the RCA, the standards defined by Royal College of Anesthetists UK, the standards are. So basically, these are the there is a compendium uh, from the Royal College of Anesthetists uh, 2020, and we are at par with them, or slightly I would say better with them. So I would say that the important part of patient safety. It is important that you do introspection of what you do in your practice. Make your own dashboard. Create a safe culture in your practice. Select few problem areas which you feel are troubling you. It could be clinical problem. It could be admin related issues. It could be academic related issues. Review your current standards. Aim to raise a standard of care uh, possible in your setup, in your freelance practice. You collect the data, re-audit, and keep repeating the cycle, and you yourself can... Uh, uh, mitigate most of the things. Uh, we introduce this concept in other hospitals also currently, but more importantly, what I want to emphasize is you have taken into consider the administrative issues also, which can influence your like organizational issue, which Captain said, uh, like academic sessions, double shift, the human error uh, because of fatigue uh, uh, and uh, the uh, mortality morbidity discussions. So those things are also we, have, we are capturing in the dashboard just to uh, make our practice uh, towards the safer side. So the, the takeaways from my talk is, can we implement patient safety standard in, in a freelance practice also? Definitely, yes. Yes, we have to be aware about the different factors, the human factors, the system factors, especially freelance practice, because where uh, in freelance practice, you have very, very little time to assess the patient. In fact, by the time the patient, the anesthetist goes, the patient is on the table in a position of uh, uh, ready to give spinal or epidural or GA. So those things have to be minimized unless we as a society develop these protocols. Uh, the attitude of the surgeons, we may not be able to change, but now things are changing. They also uh, are incorporating a lot of safety issues in their practice and it will, it will be a joint joint uh, win-win for both the uh, parties, importantly for the patient. Team building is very important to tackle fatigue component. So. My long-term aim is we, as an ISA uh, member, we have to have a safety foundation. We need to revive the critical incident registry. In fact, this was a registry that was made, uh, invented by Dr. Murli Thantibhavi, but for some reason it fizzled out and we need to revive this uh, critical incident reg registry, which is already it's ready-made on the platform. And importantly, we would like to start ISA closed claim analysis at par with what ESA does and we have our own, we will be having our own uh, data. So please start today the clinical audit and definitely it's a step for uh, improving uh, towards uh, patient safety and outcomes. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, sir. Thanks a lot. It was uh, uh, a journey from 2000 onwards till 2023 and, and uh, the amount of importance you are given to auditing and a lot of learning points in the last, uh, uh, you know, 25 minutes. Uh, we'll come back to you with questions uh, uh, and uh, before that we'll actually go to the uh, last talk of the evening and we have our uh, speaker uh, Dr. Bala Venkat Subramaniam from Ganga Hospitals who will be speaking about uh, the, the safety culture in uh, operation theater, the way forward. Now, uh, Alasa doesn't require much of an introduction again, but again, I would like to highlight a few of his achievements. Uh, he presently is the uh, he's a founder president and current chairman of Academy of Regional Anesthesia India. He served as a president of Asia Oceanic Society of uh, Regional Anesthesia from 2019 to 2022. He's been a National Governing Council member of Indian mm -hmm. Society of Anesthesiologists from 2019 to 2022. He's presently the co-chair for the Regional Anesthesia Track in World Congress of Anesthesia in Singapore next year. He is a scientific committee member of the World Congress of Regional Anesthesia in Paris this year. And he's the associate editor of the Journal of Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine, which is the official journal of the American Society of Regional Anesthesia, and also a section editor for Regional Anesthesia in both Indian General of Anesthesia and General of Anesthesia and Clinical Pharmacology. He has uh, more than 612 uh, lectures and invited faculty uh, sessions in national conferences, of which uh, more than 15 have been orations. Uh, he's delivered talks in around 47 uh, different uh, meetings internationally, uh, live workshop of around 30 plus and has got many publications and uh, in both uh, peer-reviewed journals and book chapters. 
So uh, the CV runs long, but I would stop at that and I would hand over the mic to uh, Bala sir to uh, take us through the safety culture in the OT and what does he think is the way forward and how to improve? Over to you, sir. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Murli, for that uh, introduction and for moderating the session and uh, bringing in this very important webinar for us to introspect and to evolve. When we sit in an aircraft, all of us have flown. When we sit in an aircraft, all that we think is what time we will land. Never we think whether we are going to die. Thanks to Captain Amit Singh for making this evolution in the thought process of every person who is flying and for making it so safe. And it's also an intense desire of each one of us to live as long as we can live. And it's also an intense desire of every patient to survive the surgery and anesthesia. It's also the intense desire of the anesthesiologist to zero down the morbidity and mortality. But what is the truth? The Lancet Commission on Global Surgery proposed the perioperative mortality as one of the most important indicators of the strength of a country's surgical system. And unfortunately, even today, in spite of the phenomenal evolution that has happened in various friends, fronts in the medical fraternity, the morbidity and the mortality is still very significant. Several lives are lost even if they are ASA grade one patient with no com comorbidities when they come for the surgical procedure. The way we have grown digitally and also the phenomenal uh, insights that we have got from the technology, has it given any solution to this? There are two important things that have happened which may mitigate the morbidity and mortality. One is the artificial intelligence. It involves algorithm creation, testing and analysis with the ability to perform cognitive functions, including association between variables, pattern recognition, and prediction of outcomes. So this is possibly a future, not for today's world not for today's world, especially in lower and middle income countries. And the next important thing that has evolved is simulation, which Dr. Sunil Pandya touched upon very nicely in his talk. I think simulation, the low fidelity and the high fidelity simulations are two things which will help us grow. But if you go by and large, have these technologies and the evolution of multiple safety measures have decreased the morbidity and mortality? The answer seems to be no. I bring to you greetings from the city of Coimbatore, and I think the answer lies here for decreasing morbidity and mortality. That is the statue of Adi Yogi, and today is International Yoga Day. I think the human mind, both physically and mentally, if it's fit to do a particular procedure, at the best of uh, their uh, mental and physical well-being, least complications happen. And I think as an anesthesiologist, we need to have very strong work ethics and phenomenal self-discipline when we enter the operating room. So when you look upon it, what an ideal anesthesiologist should be at work? Number one, I think this is based on introspection and this is based on the studies that have come in. The most important thing that I just wanted to convey is an anesthesiologist to perform the best, to make split-second decisions the next day to prevent death, have to sleep at least eight hours a day. And if not, minimum seven hours. This is all based on studies and showing their ability to do um, several important um, like the mathematical calculations, there were several studies which were done with anesthesiologists to have done night duties and to see how much they comprehend, how much they analyze a given problem. 
And based on this, it is believed eight hours. So I would urge all those who are attending the session that they will make an eight hour sleep, especially when they have posted a very major surgical procedure or a patient with significant comorbidities the next day. I'm emphasizing this more because um, decision making becomes tough when you have slept very less. Next important thing is to arrive at the uh, at the operating room at least 15 minutes before so that you are not pressurized. When you come even two minutes late on a surgery which was supposed to start at 8 o'clock, even if you enter at 8.2, your mind is completely ill-prepared to take the challenge. So one of the simplest solutions is to arrive early so that it gives the time for your mind to think quietly and calmly. And next important thing is when you enter the operating room, it's just not the physical presence, but mental presence. You may be physically be present, but you keep thinking about something that happened the previous day and your mind is not absorbing what is happening around, around you in the environment. You will miserably fail that day. You should have a, we should have a calm and unperturbed mind. It's a kind of a meditation when you approach the patient. You have to be in your comfortable scrubs so that you are not even distracted by the smallest of the things. And many of the anesthesiologists who, are, who require spectacles and hearing aids should have them because otherwise they struggle to read even a, a ampule or a vial. So these are small factors, but I think it's very important. Currently, one of the biggest challenge for anesthesiologists is the mobile phone. Like when you fly, the minute you enter the operating room, I think it's important you put them on a flight mode and not to touch it until everything is stable, like when the pilot announces the seat, seat belt sign is off. <clears throat> so this is a national survey on sleep, and it clearly indicated the anesthetists who sleep less than six hours have multiple comorbids like diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and coronary artery disease. One message that I want to convey to everybody who is listening that sleep not only makes us to have good decision, but also for us to survive longer. And it's also very clear that uh, the cognition is really, really affected in sleep de deprived patient and the non-technical skills has become very less. And this has been shown in simulation studies. So it's very important that you sleep well and just before sleep, not to use your smartphones, tablets and computers because you get a very disrupted sleep. And once you've got your culture the, in the best possible way, next thing is you need to be evidence-based and adopt best practices to make sure that you make the safety in your data. So quality is very important and quality in anesthesia has been defined by six domains. It should be effective, equitable, timely, efficient, safe and patient-centered. Each one has got phenomenal meaning and it's difficult for us to uh, enumerate. But to decrease the morbidity and mortality and make an operation safe, it's very important to go for proper preoperative assessment and prehabilitation. And it starts right from the registration in the hospital. Mistakes are done in the electronic on the manual record, especially when the patient, two patients with similar name gets admitted and they have mismatched ID number, mismatched blood group, then this results in uh, mismatched transfusion and mortality and death. So it starts from a small clerical error. And in pre-anesthetic evaluation is very important. I think this is the one which will result in success. It's very important, a proper physical examination, inspecting the surgical site for an infection, inspecting the site where anesthesia has to be interventions to be done, like the spinal epidural, whether there are any focus of infection. And it's also important that anesthetists have to look into biomedical parameters visually and mark it in the case sheet. Mainly, most of the times, investigations are ordered, but the anesthetist that does not even get in to see the investigations before he anesthetizes the patient. Several court cases are pending because Patients with renal parameters were given non-steroidal and resulted in acute renal shutdown. And similarly, impaired coagulation parameters have never noticed 
which resulted in catastrophic bleeding. So um, it's very important if you're working in a hospital which does not have a blood bank and you're in, undergoing a major surgical procedure, it becomes important to cross-check whether the patient has got cross-matched bed reserved, whether it's available, where it is available. And it's important to review the previous records and hospital admissions. And it's very important to optimize the internal milieu we take this patient before surgery. One of the important reasons for morbidity and mortality and theta becoming unsafe is medication management. And many times allergies are not noted and anaphylactic and anaphylactic reactions happen suddenly. And the next important thing is the medications which the patient take. I think individually we have to see the strips of the tablet, see the names, because many times you don't even know what medications the patient is taking because the, the generic name and the name uh, that uh, you come across, you are not aware of the composition of drugs, especially when there are multiple drugs. So I think we need to make it a habit to see the strips directly. And chronic medications pose a great challenge. Patients on diuretics have profound hyponatremia, which results in intraoperative complication. Patients with taking alcohol will have to be given time and supplementation, otherwise they develop delirium and look into antiplatelets, anticoagulants. And patients on antipsychotics, we had a patient, we never knew that he was an allergactyl, presented to us a 28-year-old, presented it with 280, 140. First, we put on one drug, then two drugs, then three drugs, and four antihypertensives, and still we couldn't bring. Then we worked for a secondary cause of secondary hypertension, and there again, we didn't find anything. And uh, it was just the surgery was done under segmental epidural. And post that, he was sent to the ward, still with a pressure scoring around 180 by 100. His mother came back from a remote village and she gave the first dose of Largactyl, which he was taking for his psychotic, uh, uh, um, for his psychosis. And just that one tablet, BP crashed, Code Blue announced, patient was brought in and uh, resuscitated. But then I just wanted to tell the importance of uh, going into the medication history, which results in so much of morbidity and mortality. And in conditions like Parkinsonism, even skipping one dose of the medication will aggravate the rigidity and aspiration. And we also have to be very, very careful with drug interactions. We have patients who are on anti-diabetic suddenly started on hydroxychloroquine being an orthopedic hospital for the rheumatoid arthritis in the perioperative period, which, sense, which makes uh, insulin uh, more sensitive, and suddenly you see hypoglycemic episodes and uh, their patient's code blue announced. And it's also important when we put on drugs like uh, hydroxychloroquine, which also prolongs uh, the QT and arrhythmias can happen, especially when they're administered with drugs like azithromycin, ciprofloxacin, amiodarone. Why I'm talking about all this is, and as an anesthesiologist, if you have to become safer, it becomes very, very vital that you need to uh, know about this. For example, this is a case of a patient with BPH, and this patient was on uh, tamsulosin for his enlarged prostate. The minute the patient was given general anesthesia, isoflurane was an ASA grade one apart from the BPH. The BP crashed to 6040, requiring resuscitation. So it becomes vital for us to know all these factors. There are multiple examples, but I just wanted to emphasize that if we need to be safe, we need to look into all these aspects. And uh, we need to make sure that we get a good informed consent with hospital acquired infection and surgical site infection being the commonest cause of morbidity and mortality, including death. I think it becomes important to have uh, hygienic practices, including an antiseptic shower prior to surgery. One thing which has made our journey very easy is this WHO form. And I just wanted every single institution in this country to make uh, this form mandatory uh, in every operating room. I will vouch for this form. It has considerably decreased uh, the errors that we make. So uh, we need to, in the pre-operative room, we may have to have a second look, especially for <clears throat> the level of consciousness 
post sedation the previous day and the sleep apnea and hypoxia any new symptoms venous access many times there is an iv cannula but it may not be functioning all this has to be addressed in the preoperative room <laughs> adequacy of starvation i think now with the advent of point of care ultrasound all these problems can be solved difficult spinals hypoxia because you can do a lung ultrasound this is the future using the technology to find out the immediate cause of an error, of a problem a clinical problem will make us uh, to give a, a better uh, uh, safe and better and safe perioperative care inside the operating room i i think all of you know like the cockpit check it's the workstation central supply of gases and uh, in the literature majority of the time it has been a malfunctioning suction with incorrect connectors and monitors alarm settings are important and many times the alarms are switched off and we lose the opportunity to save a patient when the alarms are switched off airway gadgets have to be appropriate airways fitting masks and these are small things but most of the times these are the reasons why we missed the bus and we lost a patient and we need to have a difficult uh, airway cart and the induction is like a take off and uh, it has to be absolutely appropriate and uh, especially after injection induction if you want to change the position it's important to know that from supine to prone before you go it's mandatory to take a bp recording because many of our uh, intravenous anesthetic agent produces fallen svr and profound hypotension and checklist after you change the position aren't three blood pressure rise pressure points endotracheal tubes monitors zeroing the transducers are extremely important and uh, intraoperative temperature conservation blood conservation are truly important and it's very very important that many mishaps happen during the lunch time and the coffee break when the anesthetist goes out a new anesthetist comes in proper handover not given and he doesn't know about the clinical condition of the patient similarly happens when the day duty and night duty take over and over takes place incomplete documentation documentation as i said uh, switching of the alarms anesthetist is not being present during the crucial steps of surgery and failing to see the blood loss that has happened failing to see the amount of urine output in the uro bag failing to maintain the mean arterial pressure failing to call for help when it was appropriately needed so all this has resulted in in phenomenal amount of morbidity even medications that are loaded then the medications labeling improper communication between anesthetist and the technician mixing of drugs adding drugs to infusions anaphylaxis not checking the defibrillator not checking up the emergency drug trolley when atropine was needed there was no atropine in, and airway trolley not being complete all this and most important thing is post procedure when you shift the patient after the surgery if you do not accompany the patient to the post operative ward until it is handed over appropriately to another doctor until you see that the pressures the oxygen levels are normal many patients get critically harmed during the process of shifting hence i think uh, i try to convey i know that it's 20 minutes since i started i would stop here but i just wanted to tell majority of the time most of the morbidity and mortality could be prevented if the small snippets and highlights that i showed if each one of us adopted religiously in every single case we can make sure that uh, all the aspirations of our patients are to live after the surgery and anesthesia is honored and i think we need to be a part of a journey to make it very safe and comfortable as safe as what amit singh and team have given to the world to fly continents and i think same thing should happen to the fraternity of anesthesia thank you so much for your patient hearing thank you thanks thanks a lot sir uh, thanks to all the three speakers for uh, such uh, elaborate uh, talks about safety now without wasting much time i would just get into the q and a uh, which we have here we have a couple of questions which has popped up Uh, before that i would just like to share an anecdote which happened recently when i was coming back from pune uh, there was this uh, lady sitting next to me and uh, she got to know that i was an anesthetist after probably 10 minutes of uh, uh, being in air 
and the first question she asked me was my ma- grandmother would like to undergo a knee replacement how risky is it so my question as uh, dr bala has uh, you know reinforced the safety of airline industry i said how uh, scared are you that we are not going to land in bangalore and we are going to crash so she said uh, i'm i'm 100% sure that we land i said how can you be 100% sure then she said uh, the safety of airline industry is so good that i'm sitting here without any worry but if my mother for grandmother has to undergo a knee replacement we are all terrified so i think the the safety that the airline industry has set is a standard that we should all aspire to and that is probably the take home message from uh, captain amit singh stock and what followed with regards to uh, dr sunil pandya and dr bala sir now going to questions we have a couple of questions uh, from the chat box so we'll take the first question to captain amit singh and the question is from dr satish david jagadishan who says uh, captain amit thank for the excellent talk and nowadays the healthcare mantra is cost cutting productivity patient safety in this order of preference so how should we as a society reverse the order of priority so you have to keep the end goal in sight end goal is safety which means if uh, safety is not ensured then operations automatically suffers in between you have uh, what is called cost cutting so there are certain minimum standards which have to be adhered to and uh, like i said uh, right now the thing uh, everything has moved from a black and white to risk based analysis so it has to be a risk based assessment if you want to uh, cut short a procedure or uh, cut corners or save costs for certain reason it has to be balanced by another thing so the net effect has to be safety 100% safety but uh, there are more efficient ways of doing certain things and compensating so you can uh, take from one hand but on the other hand you have to give it back from the other hand so there has to be balance somewhere uh, there are certain uh, in aviation like there are certain procedures which we defer or delay uh, we have something called a minimum equipment list for every aircraft uh, so that uh, the idea is that the flight should continue uh, but with certain standards and certain uh, safety uh, measures so the operator or the manufacturer basically gives out a list that these are the minimum things which need to be serviceable in perfect order for the flight to continue safely there are certain things which can be inoperable or uh, deferred which means they can be for one flight or couple of flights or a few hours uh, this can be unserviceable so there are certain things we have a separate manual for that which is called minimum equipment list so if we want certain equipment to be removed or if it is not working we will not say that the flight will not commence so idea is to facilitate everything so in order to facilitate we basically have certain minimum standards and try to compensate for uh, whatever is deficient so i hope that answers your question about cost cutting so if you cut cost then somewhere you have to compensate which means you train your crew to a higher standard so that you cut costs in some procedure see if you give your crew enough rests or more than adequate rests so then you can make them work harder or longer and put them through a difficult procedure so it has to be compensated so i think the same question i would like to ask dr bala in a different way uh, now what dr captain amit singh said is there are some minimum standards that are required for flying and say when we are at the airport and we get an announcement saying that due to technical reasons the flight has been delayed for 5 hours and it could be a nut which is missing or it could be something more major and we we we, we are unhappy but we do understand that yes we it's not safe to fly but when the same thing happens in an operating theater and we find a patient is unfit for surgery either we realize that as you said some medication has been missed during pre anesthetic check or we realize that the patient's blood pressure is very high before starting and we postpone or cancel the procedure uh this, there is a surgeon who is actually at the back uh who is very unhappy 
Now, he's not the person who is uh, flying in the aircraft, but he's definitely got his own deadlines and other things to match. So how do we handle such a situation? So what do you say would be the minimum standards or uh, especially in private practice where uh, people are rushed, people are, uh, you know, uh, the, the looking at the goodwill of the surgeon uh, to continue. Uh, how do, How should you handle such a situation? I think if an anesthesiologist uh, has to grow in the most appropriate path, he has to align with the right surgeon. And a surgeon who puts his patient first rather than his surgery first or the time first. And I think it's important to move away from the surgical colleague. Though you may lose practice, it doesn't really matter. I think over a period of time, we need to prove to uh, the surgeons that if you are around, it's going to be very safe perioperative period. So aligning with the right forces is probably the best answer to this question. Doesn't matter if you lose a case. Okay, sir. Thank you. Uh, uh, Captain Amit, I've got a question to you. Uh, now, I know a few pilots uh, who do mention that when they fly, they are flying with strangers. So the co-pilot or uh, you know the person whom you are flying with, uh, you're probably meeting them for the first time. And if that person has had a bad day at home, or uh, he has come in a bad mood, you are going to be sitting with this person for an hour or five or six hours in a cockpit and trying to understand and work such a complex machine with somebody who is not in a good mood. So my question to you is, having flown more than 18,000 hours, how do you deal with such situations, one? And how do you uh, uh, tackle the ego uh, when it comes to such situations? Because it becomes very important in the times of crisis. So uh, the story doesn't start in the cockpit when the two pilots are there. Mm -hmm. uh, there is always a hierarchy uh, which is maintained, which means the captain is senior, the co-pilot is junior, and uh, the other crew. So when the crew reports for duty, there is a briefing room wherein the documents are uh, uh, collected and uh, analyzed. So as a part of the training, the commander is trained to set uh, some sort of an order and try to determine how the crew is faring. So in a informal manner, first introduce yourself, try to find out how is the other person doing, uh, which was the previous flight they did, uh, are they fatigued, not fatigued. So it's not a formal way, but informally you're trying to assess a person. So if the kind of reactions you get the, from the other person are sharp, or uh, rhetoric, or some, uh, you see some odd things, then uh, it basically puts you on an alert that this person uh, may not be in the right frame of mind. So there are certain cases wherein you have to take a call that no, this person cannot operate the flight. Uh, we call it uh, crew resource management. And in that, a part of it is how to communicate and understand the body language of a person how the person is reacting to situations. So do not take a person whose mind is not in the aircraft is somewhere else. So because that person will become a liability in case of an emergency. So you are handling an emergency. The person is supposed to assist you, but the person that person is not there in the cockpit. So you have a double emergency. So to avoid that, uh, if you find the situation is very serious because uh, what the companies or airlines forget that we come from a society. So we cannot disconnect from the society the moment we uh, report for work. So there is always an influence. So like cultures are important. You have individual culture, you have uh, personal culture, organization and national culture. So the organizational culture has to be so strong that it overrides your uh, personal culture. Which means when you report for duty, this is the way things are done here. It should be very clear that you leave your worries behind. There, there is an airline or they had, uh, there is a sticker in the cockpit door that this is the place where we leave our worries behind. And then you enter the professional area where communication is mostly through uh, standard callouts. So it is not too much of verbal discussion or something. The critical items are standard callouts, which both the parties know, or everybody knows that uh, in this situation, this is a callout. This is uh, so. There's a whole list of it. 
so things are pretty uh, streamlined um, like i said human factors is the issue it could be the cabin crew also who has had a bad day so we need to if the person has a frank and open chat it is kind of a uh, catharsis for a person and uh, you prepare yourself that in an eventuality this person will not be there or something like that so it starts from uh, the reporting uh, area that uh, the commander informally tries to assess every crew member because uh, if you visualize an aircraft it is once the doors are closed you're in a can and you're in air now you cannot get any more help you have to manage within yourself so it is the best a kind of relationship so if there are too many egos and all so that is where the clashes happen it could happen with the cabin crew also the cabin crew uh, has a big ego and uh, in dealing with the passengers so could aggravate a passenger unnecessarily in air where you cannot go anywhere so you have to set the order how things are done on this flight we are getting to know a lot of secrets about what happens in the cockpit today <laughs> <laughs> another question oh, which i like to been... add uh, <laughs> because there is a book by uh, uh, robert helmrich about uh, cultures in aviation and medicine so uh, in the cockpit there have been uh, differences of opinion and uh, we must have read a uh, few fist fights also so the same thing has happened in the operating theater also wherein uh, there has been difference of opinion and physical uh, fist fights so because people are running short on temper so what triggers them you don't know so <clears throat> there are commonalities that is the cultural aspect cultural aspect is more important in uh, if you go towards uh, southeast asia in korea etc which means uh, there the leader is whatever is said is the rule if the captain says something then nobody can contest it they have had a number of accidents because of this then there was a major rehaul in japan basically they lose their face if a junior tells you something that you have done this thing wrong it's basically loss of face and and in japan they can commit harakiri also so the cultural issue is bigger than uh, uh, the technical part i think there are a couple of comments here by dr mahesh sinha on the chat box uh, one is he uh, mentions that there is one difference between anesthesia and airlines that is an emergency so we have to deal with emergency surgeries uh, which are as dr sunil pandey was mentioning uh, especially when it comes to uh, a delivery can be as fast as probably 15 minutes so the child has to be the baby has to be delivered and the other thing he mentions is fit to fly and fit for surgery are different domains uh which uh, we agree and i think we discussed about that uh, dr bala kind of commenting and the other thing he mentioned here was there are always two pilots in the passenger aircraft but not two anesthetists for every case now the reason why i asked that question was uh, we are interacting with uh, multiple uh, uh, professionals in an operating room and the reason my question was that because you will have to deal with people who have had a bad day uh who are working especially in uh, uh, critically uh, critical situations when when they arise uh, now the other question actually to dr bala sir is uh, uh, dr sunil pandey was mentioning about uh, the anesthesia safety foundation and how it is very much needed in this country uh, what are your uh, views about this and is it really required and if required how do we go about and what is your view on this no actually i think uh, it's probably the absolute need of the hour uh, considering that uh, probably we are such a populous country with standards differing from the corporate unit to a small private hospital so we need to create clinical pathways to make it safe uh, in different uh, uh, infrastructures with uh, different available uh, human resources so i think this is absolutely the need of the hour and i think we are looking forward for this and uh, in fact uh, i think in the next week uh, we will have a meeting and uh, we have got a uh, um, lot of insights from uh, some of the multinational companies which they wanted to support us in starting a safety foundation and we will have a meeting of that and i think it's a true vision 
that uh, we need to create one. And in the coming days, once we uh, have the opportunity and uh, the ability and the responsibility, if it comes to us, we will make it happen. And one of the strongest priorities we'll have is to create a safety foundation. Thank you, sir. Uh, now, I think question to uh, Sunil Pandya, sir. I've got a list of questions here based on uh, mm-hmm. the discussions that we you had. Uh, regarding risk mat- matrix, uh, Captain Amit Singh showed us in a nice slide about the risk matrix and how you know uh, it can be classified into a red zone, orange zone, and green zone. Now, right now, one of the classifications that is taught to us is the ASA grading, uh, which tells us that whether a patient is uh, uh, very sick or fit to undergo surgery. But I have seen systems in some of the hospitals which incorporates other things into it, such as, uh, say, OSA, sco- OSA scoring or uh, multiple other things like cardiovascular risk uh, stratification uh, to come out with an eventual score of uh, how uh, risky uh, the procedure might be for the patient based on what kind of surgery it is. So what is your take on it? And do you have anything in your dashboard or in your system uh, which takes these into consideration? Uh, definitely, uh, I didn't. I uh, had to. I rushed through last few of the slides, but uh, yes, on the dashboard, if you see how many is a grade three, we we generally follow P POSM score basically, very operative risk assessment, uh, supports mouth modification, uh, which is more or less comprehensive and gives a true percentage of perioperative mortality prediction uh, with previous uh, comorbids. Like, where, for example, age physical status takes into consideration only patient comorbids. Uh, but it does not uh, take into consideration the surgical time, the type of surgery and the duration of surgery and the surgeon or the amount of blood loss. So basically, p POSM is a score that takes into consideration not only the patient factors, the environmental factors, but also the surgical factors and the uh, morbid factors. So it's more or less a more comprehensive system. Uh, and uh, to an extent, it is uh, applicable to virtually any kind of surgery uh, across all specialties. Of course, now much uh, many specialties like Euro or the cardiac, they have their own Euro 2 scores and so on and so forth. Uh, but PPOSM is more or less a good, I would say, a predict and prediction model. More importantly, it is not only the risk, but uh, it also takes into consideration the nutritional part of the risk. Because we have now, we see many patients, especially patients with cancer, uh, coming for cancer surgeries. They are uh, malnourished or they are macronutrient deficient. And we know that the perioperative complications, uh, they may have a smooth cell intraoperatively, but they have high incidence of perioperative complications, postoperative complications. So optimizing them, uh, putting them through opt- preoperative optimization, prehabilitation before we take up for major surgery uh, is also very important. So optimization. So PAC is one thing which, uh, as Dr. Barasa was pointing out repeatedly, uh, there is a time that we should uh, take the maximum advantage of the patient, stabilize the patient before we subject them for a major surgery. So people post is score which uh, we have captured the data on the dashboard, but that is one of the close things which uh, we follow in our practice. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, we have more questions coming up in the chat box. Despite uh, the time being uh, 10 past uh, 11, we, we have a very active participation. So Dr. Dharmendra has got a couple of questions, mainly to uh, Dr. Bala. Uh, one is regarding uh, mobile phone usage during surgery. So his question is, should we have national regulations about it? Um, I think uh, it's a question of n- not a national regulation. It's a question of regulating our own mind. If we think that uh, if our father or mother or brother or sister is undergoing surgery and you love the anesthesiologist to be on the mobile phone after starting the case, uh, if you would like it, then we also can do it. But if not, I think it's a regulation that we need to put. We are grown up. We have a lot of wisdom. And a patient completely entrusts us with his own life. I think it is absolutely in poor light that a person of this caliber decides to go on the mobile phone. Uh, a national regulation can be done, but who will monitor? And, and uh, what will happen if you are still using the phone? So I think these are things uh, which has got a code of conduct to be policed by our own, uh, our own mind. And I don't think we need any police to look after us. This is my thought process on this particular question. 
if so i there, can add uh, uh, one yes, more sir. uh like there was one case where uh, the patient party they won a suit uh, against uh, yes. the hospital uh, wherein uh, anesthetic was administered uh, spinal for a fracture shaft of femur and when the patient was positioned uh, patient developed a hypotension and cardiac arrest and they could not revive the patient subsequently the lawyer looked at the uh, so social media of the ns of the entire surgical team and they found that ns research had given at least about it was active on instagram and facebook and that was the reason of uh, uh, the patient i mean the personal losing the case so definitely uh, using mobile as uh, dr varasa said rightly we need to have our own uh, judgment and uh, refrain from uh, these devices especially uh, till the seat belt sign is off as you as you said during your presentation and bala sir next question to you again from our dr dharmendra here he says uh, many anesthetists i wouldn't he has written most but i wouldn't agree with him many anesthetists are not present in the ot after induction of anesthesia so how can we frame some rules about it i know your blood pressure has probably gone up now just listening to that question uh, but <laughs> <laughs> no no actually again uh, again i would say that uh, uh, this is uh, purely uh, a code of conduct that you need to put for yourself when you decide to anesthetize a patient and the life is at your party there are few things which we cannot afford to do and uh, this is one such and uh, we need to be the role model for the younger generation if the seniors leave the theater and go the younger ones are looking at it and they think yes this can be done and we can get away with that i think they should be stringent one and i feel the surgeons here should be the policemen and put anesthetist uh, if they are not inside the data uh, these are things which uh, uh, are something which we shouldn't even discuss because this doesn't uh, it's absolutely in poor light for a professional correct sir uh, captain amit singh uh, quick next question to this is something which again i had on my mind to ask you regarding the silent cockpit uh, uh, protocol now i have come across this in an anesthesia safety uh, literature that uh, at certain altitudes which is less than 10000 feet or during critical parts of a flight uh, there is no talk except for what is mostly required for running the flight now fun is it true and if so what happens because many juniors who are listening to this uh, they need to understand that there are critical phases during surgery and those are the times when uh, things should be taken in a serious note and uh, nothing else should be happening and so there are uh, different phases uh, even for uh, the other personnel to contact the cabin except in case of emergency so the most critical phase is take off and landing so that is no contact so nobody can contact unless there is uh, such an emergency which they feel will affect the safety of the aircraft and uh, beyond that uh, like silent cockpit is a sterile cockpit we call it a uh, sterile, uh, sterile cockpit yeah yeah sterile is uh, below 10000 feet uh, which is considered to be uh, most of the uh, activity or other aircrafts are concentrated uh, below 10000 feet maximum changes in uh uh the aircraft configuration speed and all happens below 10000 feet so during that phase no un- non essential talk or activity should happen so that is kind of a, a kind of a discipline and uh, we have uh, aviation is most regulated industry everything is monitored the cvr is recorded and uh, in india there is random uh, monitoring of the cockpit voice recorder uh by the mandated by the regulator so that uh, you can see if uh, a certain safety uh, protocol is being violated or not so uh, these are certain conditions uh, where we say we call it the safety window so safety window has to be defined wherein which person can contact whom at what stage uh, again uh, to enhance safety thank you now i think we are running quite uh, we are at 15 past 11 now and uh, i think i will uh, probably ask all the three speakers uh, one thing which we haven't touched much in the entire discussion is about simulation 
Now, uh, I think simulation training is the backbone of training in uh, aviation industry and is, uh, is, is, is becoming popular in uh, the medicine. And we have most of the big medical colleges having good simulation apps uh, in, uh, for training. So the question to uh, Captain Amit Singh is, how has the simulation industry or simulation training evolved? And as a head of training for uh, big airlines, how do you go about ensuring uh, quality in simulation? And when do you graduate a pilot out of the simulation to flying a real flight? And the same question will go to uh, Balasar and Dr. Sunil Pade because both of them again have worked on simulation. So uh, I think probably this would be the last set of questions if if we don't have any coming up in the Q&A. Simulation in aviation uh, started a long time back, basic uh, low fidelity simulators in the 70s, uh, 60s, basically. And right now we have uh, what is called six axis simulator, which uh, replicates the motion of the aircraft. So before we used to do certain part of a training in the simulator, and then to give a feeling of the real aircraft, there was some flying training, which used to happen on the real aircraft, empty aircraft. Uh, now the simulation is uh, uh, such that we don't need to fly the real aircraft. The simulator gives you the entire visual and uh, acceleration and everything, all the feeling as if you're sitting in the real aircraft. But at the back of your mind, there is always this safety uh, barrier that you're in the simulator and uh, you can afford to make mistakes. So, but training is the area where you should make mistakes and learn from the, make, from the mistakes rather than make them on the real when you're flying on line. So the one part of training, important part of training is learning from others' mistakes. So that uh, because evasion, the saying is that learn from others' mistakes, you won't live long enough to make them yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, this is the area simulator is that if you want to do something, do it here, not on the real aircraft. But uh, there is a flip side to it because there is always a trainer sitting behind who is kind of judging you. So when you are uh, training in a simulator, the trainees are always conscious of this person who's sitting behind, who's a trainer, who's supposed to be a very senior pilot. And uh, at that stage, nobody wants to make a mistake in front of the trainer because the trainer is always judging you. So the whole purpose of that training is kind of lost because it is uh, not that realistic, open and uh, free uh, relationship. And uh, again, there are limitations to the simulator. So that's why now artificial intelligence has come in because that can judge uh, the inputs of the trainee on uh, whatever uh, uh, flight controls or uh, devices that they're de taking because the uh, instructor sitting behind has limitations on uh, the visual capacity. Can monitor one person and one person monitoring from behind is difficult. Most important part is the retina scan, which uh, certain airlines have introduced because the eyes are the uh, pathway to the mind, what's going on in your mind. So in critical situations, basically people tend to freeze, their uh, visual scan freezes or they start scanning too much, too fast, too jerky, which means they are under some sort of pressure or uh, they are disoriented. So this uh, retina scan basically checks uh, how your pupils are dilated when you're concentrating too hard or you're not able to uh, focus on one particular parameter. So these are the limitations which a human being cannot uh, uh, analyze. So the trainer only keeps on guessing that why did you make this mistake? It could be because of this. And... Uh, there are certain aspects because we have limited cognitive capacity and attention. So when the eyes are concentrating on uh, the visual aspect, the brain has the capacity to shut down hearing. Uh, we have a lot of alarms and all. If you are coming close to the ground or there's a fire alarm, but a lot of times we have seen that if you are concentrating too hard on uh, landing or seeing the runway, then both the pilots, they say they never heard anything no fire alarms, nothing. Because the brain has kind of shut down the, that uh, aspect of uh, hearing. So 
the simulation is good but uh, the feedback is more important we have cameras available in the simulator so that post debrief debriefing we show them that this is how you were reacting so uh, the whole purpose of debriefing is that the instructor doesn't talk too much instructor is only a facilitator unless the person trainee themselves admit what they did in the simulator that is when the real learning happens so it's a kind of a mix uh, if the simulator becomes too uh, scientifically uh, kind of uh, advanced so then there has to be something uh, the the trainer what is the trainer human input is lost but the human interaction is always needed we have uh, courses which are done on uh, computer based uh, theory courses but uh, there are certain times unless you talk and debate with a person you do not come to a conclusion like chat gpt will give you an answer but once you start uh, reacting and uh, contesting the answers that will keep on changing based on the algorithm but humans uh, the one qualification is they have abstract thinking uh, so with abstract thinking then you can debate possibilities because we discuss different scenarios of possible failure multiple failure combination of failures so this aspect is limited uh, with the kind of technology so humans have that capacity so you can replace but there is a downside also thank you thank you sir that was really elaborate and uh, uh, very nice uh, uh, sunil sir your take quickly on the simulation uh, especially you have done quite a lot of simulation training in obstetrics uh, one other thing that uh, we found simulation as a very useful modality of training is it helps us in building up the non technical skills see many we have seen many anesthesiologists who are very skillful but they have very poor uh, non technical skills so building up teams closed loop communication and uh, building up uh, non technical skills which are very very essential and uh, in managing crisis situations when to call for help uh, whom to call for help how to build up the uh, the right uh, multidisciplinary team in uh, during crisis uh, more than actual skill part uh, they, they, it helps in uh, the non uh, i mean uh, the soft skill part uh, and that's what we have found it very very useful uh, when we run through uh, the simulation exercises uh, for our uh, colleagues thank you sir uh, bala sir from your take uh, one about simulation mm -hmm. uh, as dr sunil mentioned i would like to hear your thoughts about simulation in training and uh, what is your view about you know going forward uh, in no. anesthesia training uh, yeah. i think simulation has to be a inherent component of every postgraduate student because many times the clinical scenarios uh, that they will face when they get out of the post graduation <clears throat> they would have never seen it during their post graduation even like for example the arrhythmia simulation uh, for an example so it's very important to teach them on that and the high fidelity simulators have really given us a great advantage to create scenarios uh, of real life time and i think this should become an inherent component of uh, every post graduate studies and they should have uh, probably every week they should have 3 uh, uh, hours of uh, simulation and case scenarios and i think even the national organization the isa uh, we should formulate uh, a strategy and plan to conduct simulation workshop across the country especially in rural areas and two tier cities uh, where uh, they've not had an uh, opportunity to know about the recent updates and the new drugs which have come in and to make them understand and do with themselves gain confidence uh, i think this is a must and uh, it's a great tool uh, to prevent uh, perioperative morbidity and mortality thank you sir thank you uh, um i think it is uh, 25 past 11 i'm keeping a tab on time and uh, uh, probably it's uh, way past bed time and as you have already suggested we need to get 8 hours of sleep before we get to the operating room tomorrow <laughs> so i would like to just summarize uh, what all we have discussed in the last two and a half hours uh, so taking uh, uh, captain amit singh's uh, talk we had a lot of interesting uh, new ideas which were uh, you know uh, uh, discussed which included the risk matrix and the importance of threats which can be latent and active so as anesthetists we need to know which are the latent threats which can become 
active threats based on uh, situation. Uh, we need to understand what safety management systems are. And uh, risk management is something which he explained in very much in detail about the safety active group and safety review boards. Then later we had a very good uh, a slide which showed uh, the different types of uh, safety, that is the reactive, the calculative, the proactive and generative. And being the generative kind is the best and not the pathological kind. So that was a very nice uh, discussion. And uh, he also highlighted on how uh, the American system and the Eastern systems are different. And probably as Indians, we fall somewhere in between where we have uh, organizational uh, systems in one place which can uh, be strong and individuals which can be strong. Then a very nice discussion about uh, tight coupling and how to ensure checklists are used to decouple these situations. And also about crisis resource, uh, uh, resource management, of how to use all resources. Uh, so it was a very nice talk followed by you know, uh, Dr. Sunil Pandya's talk about uh, how to actually audit your own self, improve your own practice, and uh, always keep striving to uh, reach standards above what is set internationally. Uh, so that was a wonderful talk. And uh, thank you, sir. It, it was a lot of good points there. I'm sure people will go back and see your talk again and again, uh, because that had a lot of important points, especially with the group huddle, which was a very good, important thing. And finally, uh, Dr. Bala, who explained in detail about how an anesthesiologist should behave, should sleep, should uh, you know, uh, behave in the OT and also what all things can be done to optimize a patient preoperatively, improve the safety preoperatively, intraoperatively and postoperatively. And we had a wonderful discussion uh, which uh, followed all the three talks. So I would like to thank all the speakers. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Okart for giving us the platform, uh, uninterrupted platform, wonderful platform for two and a half hours. And we had uh, a lot of people who are still logged in. Uh, I know that there were people who are unable to log into the system because of the QR code, which they were unable to scan. I'm sure they're on Anesthesia TV and they will probably view this recording on YouTube uh, later. So thanks to all of you for having joined, for having stayed up so late, uh, despite having busy schedules. And uh, thanks to Dr. Bala, Dr. Sunil and uh, Captain Amit Singh for spending their evening. Uh, two and a half hours is not a small amount of time. So thanks a lot, sir. And uh, I think I'm sure this will be one of the unique webinars where we have discussed only safety for two and a half hours and including an expert from aviation. And uh, uh, you know, it's been a wonderful session. Uh, any other thoughts from yourself, sir, uh, before we close? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Murli, for making this happen, putting it together. And for the first time ever, we uh, learned uh, so okay. many important uh, aspects and factors from Captain Amit Singh. I think we'll try to incorporate all those things which we could to make ourselves better. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Captain Amit Singh. And thank you, Dr. Thank you. Motley. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Mo sir. Paula and Dr. Captain thank you, sir. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Captain Amit Singh. Thanks, sir. Huh? Good, night. Good night. Good night. Yeah, thank Recording you. Recording stopped.